It was an action-packed day for the Prime Minister of India, having landed in Indonesia last evening. Narendra Modi's official engagements began today. A visit to some of the most prominent sites in the Indonesian capital, interspersed with crucial talks. Our cover story tonight sums it up. This is the Kalibata Hero Cemetery. Prime Minister Narendra Modi began his day in Indonesia with a visit to the site and paid homage to the martyrs of the Indonesian War of Independence. After laying wreath at the memorial in South Jakarta, Prime Minister Modi was officially welcomed by the Indonesian President Joko Widodo. The Istana Merdeka Palace rolled out its red carpet to welcome the Indian Prime Minister who held both a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Indonesian leader and a delegation level talk to. Both nations agreed to cooperate on a wide gamut of issues, terrorism being the primary one. Prime Minister Modi condemned recent terror strikes in the island nation, calling for a need to tackle extremism with urgency. Friends, hal mein huye atanki hamlo mein Indonesia के निर्दोष लोगों के मारे जाने का मुझे गहरा दुख है भारत इस प्रकार के हमलों की कड़ी निंदा करता है इस मुश्किल समय में भारत Indonesia के साथ मजबूती के साथ खड़ा है इस प्रकार की त्रासद घटनाएं यह संदेश देती है कि आतंकवाद से लड़ने के लिए विश्व स्तर पर मिलजुलकर किए जा रहे हैं प्रयासों में और अधिक गति लाने की समय की मांग है the two leaders signed 13 memoranda of understanding on issues ranging from trade, culture, science to maritime security. After a promising round of deliberations, the two leaders let their hair down. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and President Widodo flew kites. The occasion was the inauguration of a kite festival along the theme of Indian mythologies. PM Modi's outreach was multi-layered. He extended his Ramadan greetings to the Muslim-majority nation with a visit to one of the biggest mosques in Jakarta and Southeast Asia at large, the Istiqlal Mosque. The Indian Prime Minister had his Madison moment in the Indonesian capital when thousands turned up to hear him at the Jakarta Convention Center. Indonesians were in for a sweet surprise when Prime Minister Modi announced a 30-day free visa scheme for citizens of the country. The Indonesian president left no stone unturned in extending a warm welcome to the Indian leader. A banquet was hosted for the Indian Prime Minister at the Presidential Palace, the highlight of which was a performance by a professional singer, Frida Luciana. Having rekindled a long-standing friendship with Indonesia, he wraps up his visit. Prime Minister Modi now heads to Malaysia and Singapore in a bid to concretize his at East strategy. Your report, The On. So what makes the Indian Prime Minister's Indonesia visit significant? Other than the strategic and economic angles, there's also a deep cultural connect between the two countries. Indonesia, as we know, is the world's largest Muslim-majority country. It's an archipelago of more than 17,000 islands. Nearly 13% of the world's Muslims live here. That's more than 220 million people, more than the Muslim population that lives in India or in Pakistan and Bangladesh. But even though it has the world's largest Muslim population, Islam is not a state religion in Indonesia. The country follows a motto that's 
very dear to Indians as well. Indonesia's national motto is unity in diversity and there's good reason for that. Even though nearly 88% of the population is Muslim, they come from more than 1,300 ethnic groups. 95% of this population is of local ethnicity, the rest are of Arab, Indian and Chinese descent. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi spoke about this diversity when he addressed the Indian diaspora in Jakarta today. For Indonesia, सांस्कृतिक बंधन से बंधे हुए हमारे बहुत पुराने संबंध हैं In fact, uh, in all the 54 countries that the Indian Prime Minister has visited since he assumed charge, Indonesia is the most diverse nation, even though it has Muslims in majority. This is a country which does not treat Hindus as minority, in fact, celebrates Hindu cultural motives. Though Hindus form not even 2% of the local population, there are thousands of Hindu temples in Indonesia. The most important is the 9th century temple of Prambanan in central Java. It is dedicated to the Trimurti. The country's official airline is named after Lord Vishnu's ride, the Garur. And now the world's biggest statue of Garur is coming up outside the Bali International Airport. The statue is being built at a cost of $100 million on a hill overlooking the airport. Being built with stone, copper and brass, it will have a sculpture of the Hindu god Vishnu astride the Garur. The language of the country is known as Bhasha, which in Sanskrit means language. There are a number of Sanskrit-inspired words. Let me give you an example. Pension in Bhasha is Grehapurna Yud. Some accounts link the island of Bali to Samudra Manthan or churning of the oceans mentioned in the Puranas. Puppet shows inspired by Hindu epics Ramayana and Mahabharata are still very popular in Indonesia. The country has issued scores of stamps on the Ramayana and Mahabharata and there's a Saryu, Sarayu River in Java just as a Saryu in Ayodhya. Now take a look at this. This on your screens is an Indonesian currency note. It's the 20,000 rupiah that was issued in the year 1999. It has an image of the Hindu god Ganesh on it. That's because Ganesh is worshipped as the god of education in Indonesia. This note also carries a picture of the country's first education minister, Ki Hajar Devantara, whose birth date is celebrated as a national education day. The note also carries a picture of a typical classroom in the country. This currency note was discontinued in the year 2004. It was withdrawn in 2008. What's more, even the president, Jokowi Widodo's grandchild, shares a name with the Indian Prime Minister. President Widodo's grandson is named uh, Sri Narendra. The Indonesian president shared this information with Prime Minister Modi when they met today. While hosting the leaders of ASEAN countries earlier this year, India's External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj recounted an encounter former Indian Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee had with a sculptor in Indonesia. This is what she told us. मुझे याद पड़ता है कि अटल जी जब विदेश मंत्री थे तो वो इंडोनेशिया गए तो उन्होंने देखा कि कुछ लोग सड़क किनारे बैठकर मूर्तियां बना रहे हैं तो उन्हें लगा कि ये मूर्ति तो हनुमान जी जैसी है तो उन्होंने बताया कि मैं जिज्ञासावश कार से नीचे उतरा और मैंने उनसे पूछा कि आप क्या बना रहे हो तो उन्होंने कहा हनुमान जी की मूर्ति तो कहते मैंने तपाक से कहा कि पर आपका तो मुस्लिम बहुल देश है और आप भी मुझे मुस्लिम लग रहे हो तो उनका जी जनाब तो उनका आप हनुमान जी की मूर्ति क्यों बना रहे हो तो जवाब मिला साहब हमने मजहब बदला है पुरखे नहीं बदले Before the advent of Islam in Indonesia, sometime between the 9th and the 13th centuries, when traders from the Arab world first came to this region, Indonesia had a Hindu and Buddhist past. Today, this country is one of the world's major emerging economies. In fact, it is the biggest economy in Southeast Asia. Apart from Indonesian, there are some 300 local languages that are spoken there. There's a lot that the world can learn from Indonesia. Unlike India, where anything cultural is seen through a prism of communal versus non-communal, this is a country that celebrates its diversity. It lives in tight embrace with its past, not in denial of it. Eight years ago, China and Russia took a significant step to challenge the global dominance of the dollar. A securities exchange opened direct trading between the Chinese currency, the renminbi, or the RMB as it's called, and Russia's ruble. This was the first time the Chinese currency was being traded outside mainland China and Hong Kong. And since then, the RMB has gained value in Russia. On your screen, we'll bring you images from China's Heilongjiang province.
There was a truck full of Chinese currency. Eight years after they first began trading each other's currency, Russia and China have now taken their economic relationship to the next level. Yesterday, China dispatched 15 million yuan in cash to Russia. This opens up a land route to transport currency from China to Russia. So why is China's RMB now Russia's favorite currency? That's a valid question. As the West continues to isolate Russia, the RMB has now emerged as an alternative to the dollar. Tough economic sanctions have crippled the Russian economy. As a result, Russia's ruble has lost value against the dollar. To defend its economy, Russia first tried to sell its dollar reserves and buy back the ruble. But the move could not stem the free fall of the Russian currency. In this time of crisis, Russia found firm economic partnership in China. It's also Russia's second largest trading partner. The RMB has wide acceptance in Russia. The country's largest energy company, Gazprom, has already begun accepting China's RMB as a mode of payment. Traders also accept the Chinese currency. Russia is using the RMB to rebuild its foreign reserves, a move that ensures stability as China's economy is on a firmer footing when compared to the rest of the world. This also works for China. China wants to popularize the RMB. Beijing has secured currency swap line agreements with 28 countries. What does this mean? It means that central banks in all these 28 countries can exchange currency directly with the People's Bank of China. Though there's still a long way to go before the RMB challenges the dollar in the international market, the Belt and Road Project, BRI, has already given it more acceptability. At a time when the White House is challenging China on the trade front, Beijing is making most, the most of its economic influence in Russia to further needle Washington. Next, we come to the South China Sea. It's another issue over which both sides have been sparring. American ships were spotted there. China protested. It said that this amounts to trespassing. China claims the entire disputed South China Sea as its own territory. The U.S. remains firm. Defense Secretary James Mattis has said that American forces will not halt their operations in the South China Sea. Uh, we are going out of our way to cooperate with Pacific nations. Uh, that's the way we do business in the world. But we are also going to confront what we believe is out of step with international law, out of step with international tribunals that have spoken on the issue. And part of this is we maintain a very transparent military activity uh, out in the Pacific. We don't hide it from anyone. We announce it through public affairs statements. Uh, the nations, our partner and uh, our partner and our allied nations uh, are very open about it. Uh, so when they do things that are opaque to the rest of us, then we cannot cooperate in areas that we would otherwise cooperate in. And while these disputes have been festering, U.S. President Donald Trump has opened another front against China. After stiff tariffs on Chinese goods, the Trump administration now plans to regulate how long Chinese citizens get to stay in America. A new policy is being implemented. It will set limits on Chinese visa applications. Washington says these new rules will help protect American intellectual property. And it applies to students studying specific disciplines. So what does this new rule book say? We break it down for you. The White House has declared an all-out war against the rise of the dragon. After announcing aggressive tariff on Chinese goods, the Trump administration now plans to impose limits on visas being granted to Chinese citizens. As per the new rule, American officials now plan to issue visas to Chinese citizens with shorter durations. Students who plan to study in the United States will be impacted the most. The new rules are expected to kick in from 11th of June this year. But why is the Trump administration doing this? Reports quoting sources within the Trump administration say that these steps are a part of U.S. government's strategy to protect American intellectual property. The Chinese are often accused of intellectual property theft by the Americans and both sides have debated the issue in the past. We will combat the counterfeiting and piracy that destroys American jobs. We will enforce the rules of fair and reciprocal trade that form the foundation of responsible commerce. And we will protect forgotten Americans who have been left behind by a global trade system that has failed to look, and I mean look, out for their interests. They have not been looking out at all. 
but the new visa rules can be seen as another flashpoint between Washington and Beijing. Reports say American authorities want to limit visas to Chinese graduate students to one year if they are studying in fields like robotics, aviation and high-tech manufacturing. Chinese citizens seeking jobs as researchers and managers in these fields may now require clearances from multiple U.S. agencies for a visa. Bureau Report, Vion. Incredible story this. Also our next one, cows on a pilgrimage in France. No kidding. Take a look. It's that time of the year when cows in France don headdresses and bells. Well, it was a sight to watch when the herd of cows climbed up the mountain roads making their way through the streets. The weekend of May 26th and 27th saw farmers in the Occitan region of southeastern France lead the annual pilgrimage which is known as a transhumans. Not only that, there are festivals organized for the cows to celebrate the climbing of the herds to the plateau. It is said that during summers, the animals find better quality grass high up in the mountains after spending the winter in the valley. It's almost the holidays for us. It's like we take leave for six months. They lead fresh grass, grass of better quality than in the valley. It allows us to be able to harvest the food for next winter. Walking a distance of more than 60 kilometers, these cows tend to get tired and here they are quenching their thirst. But it is just a matter of two days when they complete their not-so-holy pilgrimage. So next time you are in southern France and if you witness cows donning headdresses and bells, don't be amused. Make way for them, for they are on the way to the mountains. Pure Report, Beyond.